Ah, what better way to make a permanent mark on human culture than to get to name something? And I mean something good like a planet. Let's face it, who wants a disease named after them? So, how do I get to name a planet? Well, full disclosure, you can't. They already have names. But maybe there is a way. Let's hop on that learning curve and find out. But before we find out, let's have a look at how the planets got their names in the first place. When the ancients looked up at the night sky, they saw thousands of tiny lights. Most of them stayed in the same place relative to each other. And these were the stars, but some of the others moved across the course of the weeks and months. These they call wandering stars or planets. In English, the names we give to the planets comes from Roman gods and goddesses. The Romans got this idea from the ancient Greeks, who'd named the planets after Greek gods and goddesses. And the Greeks probably got the idea from the Babylonians. Mercury was the god of communication and travellers, and so appropriately, the fastest planet got that name. Venus was the brightest and most beautiful of all the planets, although only visible at dawn and dusk, and so was named after the most beautiful of the goddesses. Red Mars looked like blood and fire, and so was named for the god of war. Jupiter was the brightest of the planets that could be seen throughout the night, and so got the name of the king of the gods. And finally Saturn was named after the god of agriculture and time, as it was the slowest moving across the sky. It must be noted here that Indian, Jewish, Chinese and other cultures had also discovered and named the planets, with their names quite often being the names of their gods and goddesses. And then along came the astronomer Ptolemy. He said that the Earth was at the centre of the universe and everything revolved around it. He even had to invent epicycles, those are cycles within cycles, to make his observations fit. And there we were, stuck with that idea for 1500 years until Copernicus came along, and did some clever sums and proved that everything actually went around the sun. Then, when telescopes came along, we discovered three more planets, and the convention of naming them after the gods stuck. Even though Herschel, the discoverer of Uranus, actually wanted to call the planet the Georgium Sidus, after King George III, you remember, the mad one? Eventually sense prevailed and it was named Uranus after the Greek father god of the sky, who was the son and husband of Gaia, or Mother Earth. Neptune, because it looked blue, was named after the Roman god of the sea. And then finally poor Pluto. But we know about Pluto, don't we? So, the planets all have names, and rather unsportingly the International Astronomical Union, that's the body that's in charge of all the names of celestial bodies, won't let you rename any of them. Not even Pluto. Well, what about exoplanets then? These are planets around other stars, although these are usually given a lowercase letter as a name. Exciting, huh? The IAU has on occasion held contests to allow people to vote on names for a few of them. Okay, so we can't name a planet then. What about stars? Can we name them? Well, no. A lot of stars already have names from antiquity. And astronomers are actually quite mathsy people and prefer numbers, really. Most stars that are discovered today are named, well, numbered, by computers. They do most of the detection. There are a large number of companies out there that will quite happily name a star after you, or a loved one, for a price. Though this is in no way official, and not in any way sanctioned by the IAU, who actually call it charlatanry. Seriously. I've put a link to the IAU's webpage dedicated to this. Go and read it, it's very entertaining. So what about comets? They're often named after the discoverer, so you could go out and find a comet. But then again, we don't want to get into an apocalyptic event with a comet that has your name on it, do we? Think of the ignominy. Oh, and the headlines. How do I actually get to name an asteroid then? Or minor planet as they're now known? Well, the International Astronomical Union has quite clear guidelines on the subject, and a lot of them have already been named. And I mean a lot. That's just the A's. Actually, we'll take a look at some of those a bit later. They're quite entertaining. First though, you have to actually discover a new minor planet, and one that hasn't been discovered before, obviously. But for this, you'll need a decent telescope. 
150mm or 6 inch refractor should do it and then you've got to hope for some clear skies. That's not too easy if you live in the UK. Or, alternatively, you could sign up for a service like itelescope.net where you can rent time on a telescope at six sites around the world. And there you can control the telescope from the comfort of your own home. Firstly, you need two observations of your minor planet on two separate nights. The software equivalent of a blink comparator will then compare the images from the two nights to see if anything's moved. And if something has moved between the two images, it could be your dream asteroid. Once this has been done, a provisional designation is given. These designations are the year of discovery, a letter indicating the half month that it was discovered in, and another letter indicating the order of the discovery. So, if I discovered a new object tonight, it would be designated 2019, N, and if it was the 11th discovery in the second half of July, it would be given the final letter L. If we reach 25 discoveries in each half month, and we frequently do, a number is added to the end to signify how many times we've cycled through the letters. During this time then, the object is checked against the list of all known objects. Remember that huge list? To make sure that it hasn't already been discovered. Still interested? Well now the fun begins. The object then has to be tracked for a couple of months until we can work out its orbit around the Sun. And then we wait. If we know the orbit of a body, we'll try and find it again at its next opposition, and this happens when the Sun, the Earth and the object in question are in a straight line. We then have to find the object at four or more oppositions. Don't forget, this could take a few years. If you've done all that, and you've had an incredible amount of luck, lots of the asteroids have already been discovered, then you're a winner, and you're on to the final stage. But once we've done all that, our asteroid gets a designation number, and these are simply numbered in order, starting with series at number 1. As discoverer, you then get the opportunity to name the object. We can't just name it anything though. There are yet more rules. The discoverer has to write a short citation stating why they want to call the asteroid something specific. And proposed names should be 16 characters or fewer, including any spaces or punctuation, preferably one word, it has to be pronounceable in some language, and also non-offensive. And it can't be anything that's too similar to an existing name of a minor planet or natural planetary satellite. Also, names for people or events known primarily for their military or political activities are acceptable but only after a hundred years have elapsed since the person died or the event occurred. And names of pet animals are discouraged. In addition, names that are purely or principally commercial in nature are also not allowed. And then, you'll have named yourself a minor planet. Well done. Before we go, I'd just like to take a little look at that list to see if there's anything interesting there. And would you know it? Yes, there is. For instance, 9617 to 9622 are named after the Monty Python team. 26733 and 26734 was obviously named by a Star Trek Deep Space Nine fan, as they're named after two of its stars. There's also an Arthur Dent at 18610. Freddie Mercury is also there at 17473. The number 9000 is aptly named HAL. 8621 to 8630 are all Big Bang Theory related. I'm going to leave a link below. If, like me, you enjoy geeky lists, have a look and put your favourite in the comments below. So then, until we ride the learning curve again, go on, what are you waiting for? Go and discover an asteroid. Thank you for watching.